So then we go forward in time to when Salieri is the court composer for Emperor Joseph. This is when we hear one of my favorite lines. Actually, the man had no ear at all. Not only does that line represent more than just what the Emperor thinks of music, not only just what a lot of people would have thought of certain music either, it's something that still exists today. This trend of musicians making music that's ahead of their time, to the point where in their own day their music isn't appreciated, but years later it's loved and admired way more than it used to be. Basically what I'm saying is, Salieri is saying here that he understands enough about music to know that his music was never as good as Mozart's, and that the Emperor's preference for Salieri's music didn't seem very justified to him. Salieri wants to speak to God not just to the masses. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, I like that line and what's foreshadowed in that line. The fact that the emperor will soon come to show praise for Salieri and show nothing but awkward criticism for Mozart. And there are simply too many notes. That's all, just cut a few and it'll be perfect. So we finally get to settle into the part of young Salieri's life in which he would soon meet Mozart. He's at the house of the Prince Archbishops of Salzburg and he's looking around for Mozart, having no idea what he looks like, but knowing he could be anyone. He wanders around groups of normal, sophisticated people, assuming that Mozart is most likely to be one of them, until he hears immature shrieks of laughter coming from another room. Of course, that's not Mozart, so he turns the other way. It's here where, for the first time, we are introduced to Salieri's love of desserts, this one thing he allows himself, and so he can't help himself. He appears to trespass into a room he's not allowed to be in, and lo and behold, Mozart himself comes into the room. Now the casting of Mozart and Costanza was a very lucky one, but it came with an unfortunate event. The woman who was set to play Costanza was Meg Tilly, but she had an accident and she tore a ligament in her leg, so she could no longer do the film. At the last minute they got Elizabeth Berridge, who actually turned out to be the perfect person to play Costanza. I mean really, look at these two people. Tom House has quite a quirky face and so does she. You can immediately believe the chemistry. These pictures of Tom House and Meg Tilly, I don't know, it just doesn't look like it would have worked. Meg Tilly seems too normal, too mature. She doesn't look like the kind of person that would be able to tolerate this Mozart's weirdness. Elizabeth's performance is so convincing and it's so subtle but so obvious in the first scene. The way she keeps switching between seeming annoyed, uncomfortable, to happy and exhilarated by her love for Mozart. You see? I've stopped. Now we're going back. No! Yes, yes. No. Listen, you don't know where you are. Here, everything goes backwards. <laughs> People walk backwards and dance backwards and sing backwards and even talk backwards. That's stupid. Why? People fart backwards. Oh, ha ha. <laughs> I should obviously also mention that Tom Hulse's portrayal of Mozart is amazing, but well, he's not a very subtle character and that's for good reason. He's not the main character of this movie, Salieri is. We're not supposed to be inside Mozart's mind, we're supposed to be inside Salieri's mind. And so that's why a lot of the time we kind of view Mozart as oblivious to the things going on around him. Kind of like how Spongebob doesn't really get the hint that Squidward is annoyed by him, Plankton hates him, and Gary is a lot smarter than him. <laughs> There will definitely be many comparisons to Spongebob in this analysis, and if you can't understand why then clearly you haven't watched either of these things. But seriously, the chemistry between these two is so believable. Just perfect for each other, like, they also look quite similar to each other in a really cute way. Like, ah. I like how while she's working out what Tishaim T is backwards, we see that Salieri's already worked it out because he's such a smart guy. <laughs> We now get to the point where the music Mozart's supposed to be conducting begins playing in the other room, and Salieri realizes who he's been spying on the whole time. They've started without me. I know this kind of Michael Bay shot is pretty standard for movies, but you have to admit it works so well here. This simple movement of the camera tells us exactly what we need to know. So Mozart makes a run for it and takes over as conductor. Something you might have noticed is so far, when we've been seeing Salieri, we've always been pretty close to him, as if we know him. Because we do. We know a lot about him already. Whereas in seeing Mozart and every other character for that matter, there's mostly wide shots and medium shots. If you're an aspiring filmmaker, these things can go a long way. So if you're writing a script or a shot list, make sure you think about what kind of shot size is most important for every particular moment. Make sure the important characters and the emotional moments are close, and the less emotional, more matter-of-fact, observational things are further away. Sure, there's exceptions here and there, and directors have shown to be able to break these rules, but the point is it should have a reason. It should be an obvious thing, but I've seen this rule not being applied properly in many short films. Anyway, this is analysis, not a filmmaking lesson. Obviously, I cannot tell him 
Listen to me, Derek. Calm down. The only thing you can do now is to not have him find out this. Jesus Christ! Carlisle! How long have you been standing there for? He must have heard everything we just said, Derek. Long enough! Side note, I'm sorry, but my heart melts every time I see Constanza smiling at Mozart in this scene. We now watch Mozart's interaction with the Prince Archbishops of Salzburg, in which we see Mozart's quick attitude that goes against the status quo of what should be expected of someone working for a high-ranking person of power. Mozart would rather be cut free from employment, but the Prince Archbishop... But the Prince Archbishop... But the Prince... But the Prince Archbishop at this but the Prince Archbishop at this point values his talent. And so even though Mozart was late to his performance, the Prince Archbishop tells him he will stay in Salzburg. Mozart leaves the room to a crowd of clapping fans, and Mozart's ego takes a hold of him. We then get a smooth cut, almost a match cut, and we are swiftly back with Salieri who stumbles upon Mozart's sheet music, and old Salieri begins to analyse the piece that had been played. I like how the first time the piece played, the filmmaking and storytelling made us easily distracted, so hearing it a second time isn't boring. I introduce you to the first reason why Salieri won an Oscar. <laughs> and then, suddenly, high above it, a noble. A single note hanging there, unwavering until a clarinet took it over. This was no composition by a performing monkey. Filled with such longing, such unfulfillable longing, it seemed to me that I was hearing a voice of God. Excuse me. It's an uncut medium shot, allowing us to see the full scale of his arms, his hands, expressing the way he feels. As you can see though, this shot isn't very exciting, and that's the point. This moment allows you to stop focusing on what you're seeing, like the last time this piece played, and allows you to start listening to the actual music. And again, we cut to a similar shot to this one. It's another realisation. Oh my god, this buffoon is so talented. Salieri says he feels like he had heard the voice of God. Now this isn't the first time he says it, but the way this line is delivered is kind of half-handed, as if he didn't truly believe it at this point, but that he just felt this way in the moment. Later on in the film, when he's looking through Mozart's drafts of music, Salieri truly realised this impulse feeling was true. Mozart snatches his work, cutting off the music. It's as if Salieri in that moment felt as though the music was his, because of how personal and intimate he felt reading it, especially in relation to his love for God and how this music is the voice of God. So when Mozart takes his own music away from Salieri's grasp, you can see the immediate feeling of longing in his eyes, setting up Salieri's hope and also his assumption about Mozart's talent. This piece had to be an accident. It had to be. It better be. Which allows him to give Mozart a chance to showcase his work to the Emperor, as we see in the upcoming scenes, which as we know, would be Salieri's biggest mistake. We cut to the Emperor. You may recognise this man, Geoffrey Jones, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Beetlejuice, but this is my favourite performance from him. There's something in his very subtle delivery of every line that reminds me a lot of modern comedy. He could be a character from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia or That 70s Show. Now you say another word and I swear to God I will dice you into a million little pieces and put those pieces in a box, a glass box, that I will display on my mantle. <laughs> Well, there it is. I mean, he even has a catchphrase. Has that ever been a thing in period movies? In this scene, he's asking his courtiers about their opinions on Mozart and whether they should bring him in. What you'll notice is we're introduced to Emperor Joseph with a high angle shot looking down at him as he sits and his courtiers stand. This is a clever way his agreeableness has been displayed through the cinematography. Emperor Joseph rarely seems to make decisions for himself and instead decides to ask people around him what they think, which ultimately gives Salieri some leeway with certain decisions. Now the courtiers are extremely memorable in this film, which is something I personally didn't expect. They seem to be the types of characters in a film that could just be played by anyone and they just say the lines they need to say. Sort of like the characters who work for the East India a trading company in Pirates of the Caribbean. They hate Jack Sparrow, they say their lines, but you don't remember what they look like or anything they said once the movie is finished. The courtiers not only have memorable personalities, but throughout the movie there is a sort of sub-narrative in terms of their relationships with one another. It also allows us viewers to latch on to particular characters we agree with. In this scene we side with Baron von Sweeten as he likes Mozart's work, and we know his work deserves to be appreciated. Whereas Count Orsini Rosenberg finds Mozart's music to be too annoying, too overwhelming, too well, too many notes. 
We also see that Kapelmeister Bono acts as Orsini's sort of sidekick, always agreeing with what he says. Orsini considers himself a classy, sophisticated expert of what music is appropriate and what isn't, and so he prefers Italian operas to German operas. Bono is Italian himself, and so we see why he would agree. But without even seeing a minute of their performances, we can already tell the kinds of people they are. It's almost cartoonish. Van Sweeten's personality works as a reliable, morally sound foundation for the scene. Orsini Rosenberg's pretentiousness is loud and obnoxious, and Bono hardly speaks, but his face says so much that you completely understand his thoughts throughout every scene he's in. There's also the Chamberlain Count von Strack, who doesn't seem to be based on a real person like the others, but he also for now is on the same side as Van Sweeten which is something that comes up later in the film. So the Emperor asks them whether they should bring Mozart into Vienna for employment, and also if they should do a German opera or Italian. We see them bicker with their disagreements, but the Emperor seems to be persuaded enough by the thought of letting the opera be German, which was his own idea in the first place. The Emperor then asks Salieri his opinion, and this is what Salieri says. What composer? What do you think? I think it's an interesting notion to keep Mozart in Vienna, Majesty. It should really infuriate the Archbishop beyond measure, if that is your Majesty's intention. You are a Cattivo court composer. <laughs> <laughs> Salieri has put his suppressed jealousy aside for an act of kindness towards Mozart. It could either be out of pure kindness, or purely because he is expecting some sort of reward from God for doing this act of kindness, and at this moment the ambiguity of his intentions works so well in terms of his entire character arc. For Mozart's welcome, Salieri composes a march. It's very simple, cause <laughs> Salieri. Then the music continues onto the next scene, acting as the score. I, 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 this is a beautiful big for you. It looks so marvelous and I love it. The other one. There isn't anything really clever about that, I just think it's cool. This simple, almost childish melody playing while we also see Mozart acting childish and like some sort of snobby rich kid trying on wigs. Of course, we hear his laugh. <laughs> Now that I say that, it actually seems that maybe Salieri composed this the way it's composed because that's how he sees Mozart, but it's as if his subconscious has composed this kind of simple melody to reflect how he feels about Mozart. It's now that we get to one of my favourite scenes that I mentioned in the beginning. This is the show-off scene. for me today. Your Majesty, Herr Mozart. Yes, what about him? He's here. So immediately we are given more indication that Emperor Joseph seems to be less in control over his life than his courtiers are of his, only building this personality trait further, making his easy agreeableness just that more believable. Salieri then tells the Emperor about the march of welcome he had written. When the Emperor plays it and likes what he hears, he asks to play it when Mozart walks in. Salieri says yes, out of politeness. But we all know Salieri would have liked to play it himself, which is reflected through Mozart's awkward entrance. I actually feel quite sorry for Salieri. We can tell very clearly that he was expecting to be able to play the piece himself with his perfectly timed fingering. But instead, Emperor Joseph, a beginner piano player who can't quite play fluently yet, is playing the official march of Mozart's welcome. As Joseph plays, we see Salieri desperately trying to get the Emperor to play it correctly. Very good, Majesty. Now at the same time, Mozart is being led into the room slowly, and this has always baffled me. The fact that when Emperor Joseph asks to let Mozart in slowly, the guards seem to know exactly what that means and when to actually let Mozart come into the room. To me it kind of just demonstrates the amount of power Joseph has over the people who work for him, and that regardless of his agreeableness, people do still follow his every order and treat him with the utmost respect, particularly of the fact that they specifically stop him from entering the room on this chord. 
and I don't want to spoil it yet, but that specific chord is important in this scene, and there's something that could be analyzed deeply that may not have been the intention of the moment, but again makes so much sense when you think about it. Mozart awkwardly hangs about waiting to be let into the room, then is finally let in only to bow to the wrong person. What I like about all of this is that I find we aren't being told as a viewer to look at Mozart as a weirdo. It feels more like we're on Mozart's side, and everything happening around him is weird. Like, why did the guards just keep him outside the door for seemingly no reason? Why would the Emperor be on the piano on the side of the room and not right there ready to greet Mozart? Maybe it's just me and autistic people, but this situation feels like something many autistic people could probably relate to. The first time Mozart looks at the Emperor, he seems to be completely not there, ironically focused on the piano piece specifically made for Mozart. And then the subtle face Salieri makes implies he's loving the fact that Mozart is seeming to be ignored. All these subtle facial expressions are constantly going on throughout this scene, and it seems to tell way more of a story than the actual dialogue does. The Emperor finally gets up to greet him and this happens. Mozart. Majesty. Ah, no. Please, please. It's not a holy relic. This line is later repeated by Salieri, suggesting later on in the film, Salieri feels as though he is as high ranking in spirit as the Emperor, especially in relation to his own superiority complex over Mozart. Thank you. Please, please, Herr Mozart, please. It's not a holy relic. The Emperor tells a story about how Mozart had been in this room before as a young child how he fell and the Emperor's sister Marie Antoinette helped him up, only for Mozart to propose to her. This story is allegedly true, and I certainly believe that definitely happened. And that's all, I just love that they included that fact so smoothly in this scene. This is the only fitting situation where that anecdote could possibly be brought up. Of course the story makes Mozart laugh in his signature laugh, only to disgust the courtiers. How dare he laugh the way he naturally laughs. The Emperor introduces Mozart to all the courtiers, except for von Strat, most likely to save time in the scene. Also, he is the only fictional character in the room. Also, also, he and Baron van Swieten have similar views. I think it must be on purpose, seeming as his character seems to be pushed to the back, and then when he has a line, the context of his dialogue seems to highlight the fact that his views aren't necessarily taken seriously, being that he voted to have the opera be in German and everyone else disagreed. This is actually something I hadn't noticed until now, so as I analyse the film, we will look back at von Strack's character and see how his character is essential to the story. But as it stands right now, based on what I already know, I notice Baron van Swieten and Count von Strack do have quite similar outlooks on both Mozart and music in general, yet von Strack is a little more stern and closer to Mozart throughout the film, almost as if he reminds Mozart a bit of his father. Anyway, as the Emperor finally introduces Mozart to Salieri, we see this very egotistical, proud, yet false facial expression. It almost looks quite threatening. Salieri looks like he's saying, I'm Salieri, I'm amazingly talented. And also, you better watch yourself. I know who you really are, Mozart. I saw you back there in the Archbishop's palace talking about eat my shit and kissing her boobies and shit. <laughs> I love how so quickly after Salieri gives this look, Mozart lets him know that he can post some variations on a melody of his, and Salieri seems genuinely flattered. But then of course his face drops down again when Mozart called it a funny little tune. The Emperor talks about commissioning an opera. <coughs> opera? Uma? Uma? Opera? Okay. Opera? <laughs> Uma? Uma? Oprah? The Emperor talks about commissioning an opera for Mozart. Having no idea what's ever happening around him, he asks whether they decided it was German or Italian, and Orsini Rosenberg says this. Well, actually, sire, if you remember, we did finally incline to Italian. That lying motherfucker. <laughs> and even Bono feels a bit cheap for having to agree with this lie. Von Strack hits them with a... Did we? Oh, I love it. Mozart insists that it be German. Already there is some hostility from some of the courtiers by hearing him insist that the opera be German rather than let the emperor decide. Even though Orsini himself uses language to trick and manipulate the emperor, the difference is Mozart is always more upfront about it, which is something the emperor notices and actually seems to take a liking to. Oh, that it is. Let it be German. The opera Mozart is talking about doing is the abduction from the Seraglio, which I think is my favourite Mozart opera. I mean, just listen to these melodies. It's the end of part two anyway, so I'll play it out.
Ob es wohl auch 